Well, I want to welcome everybody to the final episode of the SMART series on TRF Tuesdays. Um, I'm Alexander Cook, and um, I am one of the developers of SMART. And before that, I was a longtime person at the Trauma Center with Bessel van der Kolk. I started as postdoc in 95 and just didn't leave um, for a really long time. Stayed there, directed the children's services, and then became the associate director. Um, uh, until a few years ago when um, our SMART team went off um, on its own. And so this is the last of our um, SMART at Home series or SMART series. Um, the other sessions, all the earlier sessions, if you want to watch them, are on the TRF website and um, as well as I think on YouTube. Um, so um, let's get started. I'm going to do a slightly quick review just um, if anybody's new. Um, so SMART stands for Sensory um, Motor Regulation uh, Arousal. SMART stands for Sensory Motor Arousal Regulation um, Treatment. Um, and so if you want more info, you can visit our um, website um, at uh, www.smartmoves.com. SMART Moves Partners, sorry. I'm just pulling up... Um, my PowerPoint here for you. I'm going to show you a few, few slides today, um, and then um, and then we're going to look at a video. And so um, that is the plan. So what are we focusing on today? Um, today we're going to focus on attachment building through um, co-regulation. Okay. So this quick review. Um, uh, it starts with the smart spiral. So basically um, attachment building is one of the three threads um, in the smart spiral, along with somatic regulation and trauma processing. And that smart spiral, um, those three threads are supported by using the regulation tools and the therapist skills and video reflection in order to um, weave those threads together. Okay. And so over this past six weeks, um, you have gotten to learn, um, about the regulation map, which is how you really measure and, um, look at somebody's arousal level and, uh, figure out how to understand them, um, in this context with the integrated zone, um, here, and then, uh, hyper aroused state up top and a, um, hypo aroused state with these, fluid zones. And um, we use this um, map to sort of help guide us and help us make decisions um, on where to go within the spiral and what inputs to use. So hopefully over the past six weeks, if you've been able to join us, we started out with learning about the map. And then we looked at several regulation tools, some of our core regulation tools. We looked at how to use your muscles through proprioceptive input, the power of touch through tactile input, um, vestibular input in our rock and roll series, and um, the use of rhythm to find the beat. So today we're going to look at how you pull together um, some of those um, tools and focus on one of the threads. And then we're going to look at attachment building. So um, the attachment building thread is really focused on two main concepts. It's focused on co-regulation and on rhythms of engagement. And so we're really trying to develop effective co-regulation and um, uh, building sort of new rhythms of engagement. So the exploration of the tools and following the child's lead um, help find out what the child likes and what the child doesn't like. Um, and through that process, it helps both regulate the energy um, and arousal level of the child, as well as form this sort of safe and secure base in the relationship. So let's think a little bit more about co-regulation since that's what we're thinking about today. Um,
So co-regulation is using the relationship to help regulate the arousal, right? It's using, and that doesn't have to be um, a person necessarily. It might be an animal, which many of us use um, as our uh, co-regulator, um, one of our primary co-regulators for some of us. Um, but some of the other ways that we regulate um, are, we start out in the world using auto-regulation, which is our mostly unconscious form of regulation. And so as infants, um, infants, you know, suck their thumbs and they find all kinds of ways that they're not consciously deciding to, to do this, but they're using these little um, methods that they have to regulate and they're sort of built in um, ways. And we keep doing that even as we get, we develop our whole um, cortex and our prefrontal lobes, um, we still use a lot of um, auto-regulatory strategies that we uh, just unconsciously um, start doing without even really thinking about it, our foot tapping, for example. So auto-regulation is usually this unconscious form of regulation. Our other mode of regulation is self-regulation where we consciously are deciding to use a tool or a skill to regulate our arousal. This means we come home from work and we're all jazzed up because you know, we got into a fight with our boss or something happened and we decide to go for a run. It's like, that's a self-regulation tool. It's deciding what was it, or maybe I, maybe I don't need to run. Maybe what I need is some yoga right now. Um, and so that's what we would call self-regulation. So let's put these together, these modes of regulation with um, inputs, with the inputs that we've been talking about over the past several weeks. Um, what are ways that you might auto-regulate um, that involve proprioceptive input? This might be your foot tapping, right? This might be drumming your fingers on, on the uh, surface. Without even thinking about it, you start doing it. But it's a way that you get a little bit of input um, from a muscular standpoint. Think of some vestibular inputs that you might do. If you were in a spinny chair, which I'm not, but... Um, you might just sort of start spinning or what do you see um, kids do um, in class all the time? They're always leaning back in that chair, right? They're always taking their four, their, their, uh, their chairs and tipping them backwards. And in doing that, they get a little bit of movement and rocking, which gets them a little vestibular input. And they're doing this unconsciously. They just do it. Teachers always like four on the floor, four on the floor. They don't, they just keep, uh, they just keep going. Um, some tactile inputs that are, um, you know, that are auto-regulatory, right? You're not really thinking about it. Um, that might be thumb sucking. Um, that gets you um, a tactile input. Your hand wringing um, or rubbing your, um, rubbing your legs, um, different ways that we get um, a little bit of tactile input without even really thinking about it. And you kind of notice as you talk, as we talk about these, that there is a rhythm built into many of the auto-regulatory strategies, depend, um, doesn't matter what kind of sensory input it is. Um, there is sort of a rhythm built into it. Um, so. Now let's think about the same thing from a co-regulation standpoint um, in terms of what are the different ways that we co-regulate from proprioceptive um, vestibular, tactile, and rhythm standpoints. Um, so one way is that we, oh, before I say that, um, the thing about co-regulation that's really interesting is there are ways in which the adult can support co-regulation. For example, look at the picture um, of the um, therapist using the ball on top of the child. So this is a way in which they are um, co-regulating and, the, and the, the therapist or the adult is helping support some of that co-regulation. And then there are other times that they are fully um, engaged together. And this is the co-regulation is going on like in a much more um, mutual kind of way. Imagine this little boy on the ball and the, the mom uh, perhaps holding his hands and pulling back and forth. And so co-regulation can sort of vary from supporting the child and what they need to full-on engagement. So if you think of that proprioceptively, um, there's lots of ways that we can do um, 
uh, you know, different kinds of um, proprioceptive input. We can play dodgeball. We can play tag. We can play ping pong. Um, we can toss a ball back and forth. It's a really um, simple one that is incredibly effective um, and can be done um, in an office. What are some of the vestibular things? So vestibular together is maybe a little bit more challenging. Um, you like might be rocking together in a rocking chair, um, but an adult supporting a child, imagine an adult pushing a child on a swing. That's a co-regulatory experience because they're involved in it together. They might be talking at the same time while the child is getting this vestibular input. Um, holding a child upside down, flipping them upside down or holding them by their feet. Um, again, another very interactive way um, that uh, um, you can provide um, vestibular input. Tactile input um, in terms of co-regulation. This is um, applying, you know, like in the picture, you see um, applying some weighted pressure. Uh, this is a way in which we're co-regulating together. A child can't really do that by themselves. They need somebody else to help them with it. Um, Rubbing a child's head um, can get a nice, really light touch or rubbing their back or shoulder um, is a nice way to give um, some gentle tactile input um, that can be incredibly soothing and calming. Um, and then our basic hugging, right? Hugging gives a, a nice deep pressure um, hug and uh, um, as well as all the love that it um, goes with it. So, Let's think about rhythm now for a moment in terms of co-regulation. And here's an interesting example. If you think about playing basketball with a child, um, the child both gets to do their individual rhythm, right? They're, they're bouncing the basketball um, and that's their own sort of individual rhythm that they're finding there, um, as well as there's a rhythm between um, adult and child um, where there's a rhythm in terms of turn taking, there's a rhythm in terms of like, um, figuring out moving which way to go. So there's both um, an individual rhythm and an interpersonal rhythm that happens um, when playing basketball. So those are just some examples um, of how um, regulation um, looks like in these, uh, in these different forms um, and different inputs. So self-regulation then is all these different things, but with intention, basically. Um, so figuring out once you've kind of figured out what the child likes, then they make their decisions on what they need um, at the moment. Um, and that's developing their whole toolbox um, that we talk about. So what I want to do now is um, show you a video. Okay. And um I'm gonna show you a video of, um, it's actually me and my son when he was much younger. Um, and I'm gonna show you a three minute clip. And the point of this is really to integrate all of the things that you've been learning over the past six weeks, okay? So um, I want you to track his energy on the regulation map, okay? I want you to watch for ways that he regulates, like what, does he use auto-regulation? Does he use co-regulation? How much um, intention and self-regulation is he using? Notice what inputs he's seeking. Um, he, what does he like? What doesn't he like? Is he more of a proprioceptive kid, more of a tactile, vestibular rhythm kid? Um, and then in terms of the attachment building, how do all these factors affect our connection? Okay. Um, and then I'm going to talk through the video um, after we've watched it. Okay. So that's the plan here. All right. We can make up whatever rules we want. Are you getting closer? Can I make Yeah. You can make up whatever rules. All right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now let's 
it is perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Start here. I'm sorry. Start here. Do you want to put it? You want to make a sandwich? Yeah. Do you want to be on your tummy or anything? Try that. Are you comfy? Yeah. Is it nice and cozy? How about this? Do you like it a little bit heavier? No. No. But I don't, I, would I? No, I don't know. Some people like heavy stuff on them. I'll try this kid. George, what's it? Unique. It is small, but can you bounce? Mm -hmm. I bet you could have eaten that way. Shocker. Shocker with a big ball? Yeah. I think there's a goal. Whoa. That was good. Okay. So let me take you through that video a little bit from the four questions that I was asking um, at the beginning. So if you, one is tracking his um, arousal level, right? So where did it start? It started where there was a misattunement on my part. Um, I, he took my question about, we can make up whatever rules as like saying that I didn't like his rules, which is why he um, shut down. So you saw him come down on the regulation map and really he didn't go to a, a hypo traumatic state, but he definitely hit into the um, fluid zone because I was, he was not making eye contact. He was shutting me out. Um, and what was he doing then to help himself in that moment? So he was auto-regulating. He's just using his feet and um, playing with the, um, those little stepping stones that he was making the obstacle course out of. That was sort of an auto-regulatory strategy. Um, as I was trying to make a connection and co-regulate him and get him back engaged um, in playing together. And so both figuring out what was going on because I was a little confused at the moment and then um, trying to help get him re-engaged. So, um, so then he decides to sort of go back into the game, but he's feeling vulnerable and asks if the door is closed and nobody can walk in on us, right? Um, and so he goes on with the game, um, and I take my turn. And so we're back, we're back together, but it's still kind of distant, right? If you're looking, if you're tracking where our attachment building is going right there, it's like we've repaired, but we're a little tentative. Um, he's a little tentative with me. Um, and so he kind of goes off and does his own thing. He seeks some tactile input. He goes over to the cushions, which we try. And I love his, his, uh, comment of, um, I, I apply a little more pressure and he says, why would I like that? Um, and, uh, it's just, it's a, it's a great example because so many of us think, um, that that's going to feel good. And for my, for most people, it actually does, but, um, a lot of times for a lot of internalizing kids or, or people, adults, um, they don't necessarily like that. They already have the weight of the world on their shoulders. They don't really want more pressure. Um, so, that's where you just, you're always asking, you're always figuring out, well, how does this look? What, how does this feel? So then he um, gets up, his, his, his arousal level is coming way back into the integrated state and we're getting a little more interactive. And then he um, 
uh, tries out the, the bouncy ball and then we play soccer, which again, now we've stepped up a level in our interactive connection. Right. Um, and he's getting a lot of proprioceptive input now. Um, after he did his little bouncing on the ball, which was getting him a little vestibular input. And then um, uh, we play soccer for a little bit and then we switch to the, um, to the volleyball. And we've got this rhythm going, right? We've got, we're going back and forth. Um, we're really engaged now. We're really in this together um, and we're cooperating and trying to, and actually when you add the counting, it adds to the rhythmic um, input um, which actually made it more um, successful in terms of like us um, getting a higher number of, of um, touches on the ball. And so then what do you see? You see him kind of collapse at that moment into the cushions. And that's the moment we often look where we call it sensory satiation. When the child has gotten enough of what they were looking for, you see this like, ah, moment. Um, and for him, it was so, it was, um, very visual because you could see him sort of collapse into the, into the cushions. And so um, my choice as a therapist skill is matching him is going, okay, he fell down. I'm going to lay down too. Um, and then he climbs on my back. And so if you're tracking the growth of our attachment building, you can see from the rupture in the beginning um, through the repair to the real connection. And it was through using different kinds of inputs um, and paying attention um, to how to regulate. So I'm hoping that that gives you at least a taste of what, how you integrate using these um, tools. Um, and we just ex gave you a handful of the tools um, and we didn't give you any of the therapist skills, but so how these all come together then to support building these threads um, and they're all happening simultaneously. I happen to take this clip and um, really focus on the attachment building, but there are other things happening. There's his own like somatic regulation happening at the same time. And you might say there was a little trauma processing because he was really scared and vulnerable um, about um, being walked in on. Uh, and that, uh, so, you know, um, for kids who have a more traumatic history than he does, um, that's, that's a big deal. So it, it, all these things are happening simultaneously. And we were kind of just looking at the one thread. So, um, now I'm going to open it up for questions. And if you want to, um, type your questions into the chat, then, um, I can respond to them, um, as we go. When do you integrate the caregiver into sessions? Um, that's um, a really good question. It was one of our main questions before we even built the attachment building thread because um, that was everyone's, everybody that we trained, that was their main question as to um, when do you bring that person in? And so that ha it depends on a lot of factors. One, it depends on the age of the child. So the younger the child's in some ways, the easier it is to build it in. Um, the older the child, um, teenagers are not going to want their parents in sessions all that often necessarily. Um, it also depends on the um, caregiver's um, ability to um, regulate their own emotion, um, whether they can tolerate um, being in there. And so when you do part of your assessment, you, you ask at some point you ask um, parents to come in just to see what the difference is between when you've seen the child alone and when you see um, the child and parent together, how um, their arousal levels are really different um, or the same um, when the parent is in the room. Um, and depending on what kinds of material is coming up, um, you know, you might want to, um, not have the caregiver necessarily exposed to kind of different kinds of traumatic experiences if it's coming up in the, in the play, because um, they may or may not be able to um, handle that. And then that, that then inhibits the child from expressing what they need. Um, I've always been kind of a fan of a combination. So having the caregiver in some of the session um, and then having some alone time and you use the alone time to really kind of figure out what kind of tools and inputs um, work for the child um, so that you can then help introduce that to the caregiver. 
Um, and then trying to make the caregivers are often used to using their time in the session as, um, uh, you know, like the, let me tell you everything that my kid did wrong this week kind of time. And so it's really a, a little bit of a mind shift as to trying to find some kind of positive way to play together, to get them both in an embodied play, whether it be a tag, whether it be um, uh, building a fort together or building an obstacle course together, whether it's the parent who might not be very physical and might have to sit on the side, but can at least witness um, what wonderful thing the child is doing, how they're jumping on the trampoline and then flying through the air into the crash cushion. Um, so there are different ways to participate. Um, it doesn't have to be like full on full body. So um, we we'll have another question here about um, note writing for third party billing for a session like this. So what you would talk about is how we worked on affect regulation um, and developing certain um, skills and tools that were useful um, to regulate affect and um, where a child and the goal might be to have a child um, make use of um, three types of three different types of inputs um, and skills that would be useful. Or a goal might be to increase the, um, the way a child uses um, a caregiver um, to regulate um, in order to develop their ability to accept help um, from an adult. Other questions, comments? Did people have any different reactions to the video? Do you do more trainings? We do our foundational training, um, which is a um, basically a 15 hour um, course. 10 of them are um, two hour lives once a week for five weeks. And then there's an, um, some asynchronous learning as well. Um, and so that's all available on our website. Um, next one's starting October 22nd. And then I think there's another one um, starting in January. Um, oh, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, I always like, you know, when we do it, when I show the video on the trainings, um, well, it's, first of all, it's longer, um, but, but it's, it's helpful to get your feedback, but I understand in this, um, context, it's a little bit harder to get everybody's feedback, but it is really always interesting to watch video and how every time you watch it, there's something new that pops out at you. Um, Mirror neurons is, is very, yes, hopefully the mirror neurons are what are getting activated when you, um, you know, when you are matching behavior um, or matching tone of voice or matching um, action. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, How does it work when working with adults? Um, or helping adults work on these issues alone. You know, what we found is when we wrote the manual for adults um, or adapted the manual for adults, I should say, there was much more emphasis on um, the therapist having to give permission and show, because I think adults' natural sense of play might be a little more inhibited than most kids, right? Um, and so um, adults sort of in a more... Um, subtle kind of way, showing ways that um, you can get these inputs that aren't necessarily so sort of, you know, jumping around the room, um, but they might involve, um, you know, like a, an aerial hammock we, is one of the um, um, apparatuses, apparati, um, that, we, um, that we use. And it's a very subtle, but it's a very powerful um, input to folks that gives them a lot of vestibular input. Um, and so, you know, just um, figuring out different things, but also having the, the therapist be more of the, the co-regulator and um, being involved and engaged in the full in a full engagement is helpful with adults. Um, where can you see the video? Um, well, it's probably on the, it's, it'll get recorded with this um, when Pat, um, puts it all together. So you'll see it, um, 
later on today, I think it shows up or tomorrow on the, um, uh, on the website. Um, <laughs> boredom is your mind asking your body to play. <laughs> I like that. Um, yes, it is a way in which we really need to get a little more stimulation. Our, our body is going, please, please something. Um, um, yes, Pat is saying that later tonight, um, that video will be available. Um, and that is, you know, like for a lot of kids who are neglected, um, early on, like they're always, they're seeking stimulation constantly. Um, and that's actually where a lot of sexualized behaviors come out and a lot of problematic behaviors because they're so seeking some kind of stimulation. Um, and that's where if we can give them more input and more, um, more ways that they can um, engage with us, uh, that, uh, that really helps that the whole sort of boredom and therefore and, and lack of um, stimulation that a lot of our neglected kids have. Well, it looks like we're at 4.30. Um, so I just wanna say thank you to everyone. Um, and, um, oh, there's a couple more questions here. I'll just grab these real quick, okay? Um, yes, do uh, people uh, ever discredit us and say, it seems like you're just playing. And so then it's on us as the therapist to explain why this is useful, um, why this is evolutionary. You can, you can certainly point to evolution and the way that um, dogs play and animals play. Um, and there's wonderful YouTube videos of all kinds of animals playing and what the function of that is, um, how it uh, provides socialization and how it, um, it, you know, how um, it has much more to do with stimulating um, neural development and neural growth um, than just playing. And so that's why I, I use the example of um, tipping back in the chairs, because that's often what people are saying, stop messing around, stop don't do that while you're doing your homework. You're not paying attention. Um, actually, what they're doing is regulating themselves so that they can play attention at the same time. Um, and there are definitely some cultural differences um, across all kinds of cultures where it's not okay to question authority. And so the whole idea of following a child's lead is not, um, it takes a little bit of convincing as to why that is actually useful. It's not just giving them all the power and control. Um, it, it, it actually is effective and you have to kind of try it out before you can um, appreciate how that changes the dynamic. Um, another person is getting um, confused between the vestibular and proprioceptive. Proprioceptive is really um, muscles and joints. It's getting muscular um, um, input and play. Often when you do that, if you're jumping or um, running around, then your head is moving, which is what is the vestibular part um, of the input. So if your head moves this way, this way, this way, or up and down, that's all vestibular input. You can feel it in your ears as you move those different directions. And that's what's getting the vestibular input. The reason um, you might be getting them confused is because they're so often happen together, right? They're, they're both kinds of inputs. And we don't know which one is actually more um, influential to the person themselves. Um, I'm not sure that they know, but um, so um, on that note, let us um, wrap up this series. I really appreciate you all. You've been such um, a great audience and you've given us such really nice feedback. Um, we really appreciate it. And um, uh, we really are grateful for this opportunity. Thank you to the TRF for um, allowing us to have this forum. Um, so good luck uh, and uh, hope to see you all soon.